Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here. And it's my favorite moment of the week. I get to bring the Word of God. And I just love the Word because the Word is so powerful. It's so rich. It's so enlightening. It's such a game changer in our life. Do you know what? I was uh, just walking with someone the other day and they were telling me that they could pray pretty well. They prayed regularly, but they found it difficult to read the word regularly. Now, this person happens to be a reasonably new Christian. And so there's some things which they just find difficult to engage with when they open the word. And I guess we all have known that. Maybe you're a a uh, mature Christian, maybe you've been reading in the Word, walking with the Lord for many re for many years, and you know exactly what we're talking about here. You go, yeah, I remember those days when I used to open up some of those books and think, man, what does that mean? Or read that verse and you think, goodness me, I just don't even know how to begin with that. And so I could really understand where they were coming from. So I gave them some advice about where to uh, begin in the Bible. And actually, if you're interested to know, that advice was to begin with some of the Gospels particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, because they're just stories and introduce us immediately to Jesus. In particular, the Gospel of Matthew, which is really all about the kingdom of God. And so it introduces us in a story way, a, a very followable way, uh, Jesus, but also to Jesus's favorite theme, the kingdom. And uh, so I was saying, hey, why don't you start there or also read Acts, which is a really accessible story that you can read through. And I'm um, told actually of a time when I was in Athens on holiday and I read the book of Acts there and came across the passages of scripture where Paul himself was in Athens. And it was just amazing to connect everything. I had that really graspable feel. And so I said, hey, begin there. Maybe don't go to Lamentation straight away type thing, you know. But also Genesis is just fantastic, full of stories. And when man realizes that those stories are trying to show us Jesus, so we think of Noah and we think of Abraham, we think of Joseph and all of the parallels that are there showing us actually God was trying to tell us about Jesus all along, it becomes really alive to us. But one of the things I said was this, hey, even if you do nothing else, but simply open your Bible and read, you're doing something really powerful. Because the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is active. The Word of God has power. And actually, when we were walking, we were in the sun. And I said, look, do you know what? I don't understand everything of how the sun works and how solar energy works and how all the science works for things to grow because of sunlight. I'm sure I learned all that in the school. But what I do know is this. Even if I know nothing, the very fact I'm in the presence of the sunshine is having an effect on me. It's giving me a bit of a suntan. If I'm not careful, it'll give me a sunburn, but it's having a nice effect on me. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's having an effect whether I understand anything just because I'm in its presence, so to speak, and it's getting to do something on me. And so that, it's like that with the Word of God. As soon as we open it and start to read it, it itself does something in us. It is in itself starts to work and function because that's what it does. Even if we really understand everything or theological scholars or not, that's not really the point. The point is the power in the word starts to touch our life. And so, of course, we want to be able to learn God's word and study God's word and engage with God's word and know God's word and understand God's word in so many different ways. But I want to encourage you, just by even being here today, just by even saying, I'm opening my life up to come under and to receive and to be hit by and to be engaged with by the word of God, God himself will do something in you. So with all that said, I want to bring us to this word today. And this word I'm calling, everything can change. Everything can change. Hey, maybe you're joining us locally here in Germany. Maybe you're joining us from another country somewhere else in the world. I don't know your personal situation. I don't know everything that's going on in your life right now, but God does. And I know this, as human beings, we go through stuff. We have situations. We have challenges that come in life. 
And boy, they can come like that. They can come with one phone call. They can come with one doctor's appointment. They can come with one knock on the door. They can come with one letter. They can come with one email. And that email wasn't there five seconds before, then suddenly it's there, you click open and bang. Stuff happens in life. Things change in life. But I want to say to you, everything can change in life as well. There's a story I want to read to us from Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. And it goes like this. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Pleading fervently with him, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with them, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Now let me stop there. Because I want to unpack this as we go. I want to pull some things out as we go. And the first thing I want to pull out is this. In verse 22 it says, Then a leader of the local synagogue. It starts with this person's position. It starts with his status in society. A leader of the local synagogue. This man had standing, this, had, this man had position, this man had status, this man had a title. But I want to say to you, so often we as human beings realize that our status, our qualifications, our education, our titles, what we have in the bank account, the holiday home we have in Malibu, the holiday yacht that we have stationed off Monaco, whatever we have, there are moments that come in life where it says our status, the titles, the positions, the don't you know I'm a director of the company, whatever it may be, actually has no effect. Because just like the story continues, it says, whose name was Jairus, and then goes on and says, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading firmly with him, my little daughter is dying. So in the space of only a few words, we go from status to actually this person of status and title and position and qualification, who maybe has so many titles that they don't know what to do with them, suddenly becomes, actually, he's just a man called Jairus. And actually, this man is a dad. And this dad has a little girl that he loves. And it makes it and brings it onto this human level. It, it, it deals very quickly with the fact that status and position is nothing in life, really, because all of us are humans. And at some point in our life, we're going to be very aware of our humanity. We're going to be very aware of our mortality. We're going to be very aware that I see myself as I really am. I'm, I'm a human. I am a created being and I am dependent on a creator for the very life and very breath in my body. And there's moments in life that we become very aware of our humanity, very aware that there is not one qualification or one position or one paycheck or one possession that can make any difference because as a human right now, I am dependent on deity. I am dependent on divinity. I am dependent on God as a human being. No longer can anything else help me. I am stripped bare of all title, position, wealth, and anything else I have accumulated. And in this moment of my life, I realize my total need of God. In my life recently, one visit to a doctor changed the narrative of what I've been going through recently. And I know what it's like to hear something that changes in an instant, a situation. And I knew in that moment there is, there is nothing other than God that can be my answer. 
And so I went to him to speak into my life and my situation. And I'm so glad he did. And I'm so glad he's still speaking. And I'm so glad I know that I know that my God is true and faithful. And this is exactly where this story brings us to this man, this dad. And makes it something very relatable to you and me. And it says that he was pleading fervently with Jesus. In another translation it says he was in despair. Despair brings many people to Jesus. That moment when there is nowhere else I can go. There is nothing else that can give me any possible answer. I am at the end of myself, at the end of my contact list, at the end of my wealth ability, at the end of my education qualification ability. Not that there is anything wrong in those things, but we suddenly become aware of our humanity. And I said, I am utterly dependent. I have no other answer other than you. And as a dad of a little girl, I'm coming to you. And I'm asking you to do what no human can do. I'm asking you to do what no one else can do. I'm asking you to do what nothing else can facilitate. As a human being, I'm fully and utterly dependent on you, God, to move and to do what God alone can do. I'm 100% fervently pleading with you. I am in despair. Many, many people get to that moment of despair before they reach out to God. The gospel never changes. The fact that God is ready, willing, and able to reach out and to change a life never changes. The message of hope in Christ never changes. It's just that the circumstances of people who at one point were not ready to hear, who said everything is fine in life, who said, my career is going great, who said, everything is fine with my family, who, who, who said, I don't need anything to lean on. Suddenly something changes and they are faced with their humanity. Suddenly something changes and in despair they say, what was that you were saying again about a supernatural God? Suddenly something changes in their life which makes them ready to say, please tell me, and in my despair, I'm ready to receive from God. I've become aware in the last few minutes of my life, my total humanity in need of God. The message doesn't change, but circumstances in life do. And here was a circumstance in his life where he came to God in this moment of need. Are you needing a miracle are you needing god himself to step in are you aware of your humanity where you need a divine encounter to change the situation this story will give you hope because this jesus has not changed the bible says jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever he has not changed and so he goes on his way to go to this man's daughter and we're going to jump now to verse 35 on to 42 and in between these verses where we stopped in verse 24 and verse 35 there's this story there's almost like two stories for one here because the story brings in another story another miracle and it's actually the woman that presses through the crowd who has a bleeding, and has been bleeding for 12 years, and presses through and takes hold and touches Jesus' garment and said, if I can only touch the, the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And she gets healed and he, 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 he deals with that situation and then is speaking to her. And we pick it up in verse 35, where it says, while he, that's Jesus, was still speaking to this lady, still, still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, do not be afraid, just have faith. Now let's just stop there for a second. And I want us to get into that moment together and imagine what's now going on in the heart and mind of this dad of this little girl. We have a desperate parent. We have a, a parent who is, is 
is desolate with the situation and comes and fervently pleads with Jesus, please come and hear my little girl. Please, she's dying at home. Please just come right now. Lay your hands upon her and do a miracle. And he says, okay, I'm coming. And then on the way, Jesus stops and speaks to this woman and deals with the situation and is still speaking with her. I want you to be with me here in this moment. Imagine what the world is for this dad at this moment. Jesus, why did you stop me? My little girl. The dad wasn't saying, well, of course, he's got to stop and talk to everyone. He has to treat everyone fairly. And, you know, I can understand he's a busy guy. And No, the dad was saying, I'm just here as a dad. The only thing I care about right now is my little girl. I wonder if he was internally thinking time is of the essence. And then these messengers come and say, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. In the middle of this moment of need, others in this man called Jairus' life came and said, this is how the situation is. The situation you have just brought to God, the situation you have just asked Jesus to deal with, The situation you've just come in desperation to him with is actually now over. That was their opinion. Actually, they're now decreeing and saying, and we know you've asked Jesus, the God, to deal with something here. But actually, it is now like this. The situation is irredeemable. Have you had opinions come your way? Have you brought something to God in prayer? Have you brought something to God in desperation and said, God, I need you? And then others in your life, experts, friends, family, colleagues, whoever they might be, have come and said, it's no use now because this is how it is. And you have believed the report of somebody else on that situation. It seems quite quite final. She is dead. We're telling you, Jairus, it's over. Maybe in that moment, if you say, well, you know, guys, you must be right. What you say about the situation must be truth. I will now do as you say. I will not long, no longer ask Jesus to come. I'll tell him to stop. Maybe you can identify with maybe something like that in your own life. And here's the other thing. They say, there's no use troubling the teacher now. Jesus was a teacher. He taught many things. But isn't it interesting, and I would say to you this, isn't it interesting that that they use this title in particular at this moment? Look, you you don't need to trouble the teacher anymore. Maybe to these people that came from his household and said, the messengers arrived and said, your daughter's dead. Just saw Jesus as a teacher. Look, look, he's just a teacher. You don't need to trouble him anymore. He teaches good stuff. He teaches life skills. He teaches on life and how to live life. Maybe they saw Jesus as only a good teacher. And that's why they have referenced him in this way. Maybe they did not see him as Jairus did, which is he is the change maker. He is the miracle worker. He is the healer. He is the God of the universe. He is the one with whom all power resides that can change the situation. He is the one with divine power to move. He is not just a teacher. You see, maybe you are seeing God today as a difference maker in your situation, but you have other people in your circle of life who see him only as a good teacher, as a moral guide. And they're saying to you, don't trouble him anymore. He can't do anything anyway. Why are you going on about miracles and believing God to do something? And they're trying to have the loud voice into your life, which is basically saying, look, he's just pretty much a life coach and has some good ideas about how to live life and be a nice human. But there's nothing beyond that. But you're saying, no, I see beyond that. Yes, he taught, but my goodness me, he's actually all these other things as well. And he's the miracle maker. And that's why I went to him in the first place. I didn't go to him in the first place because I thought he would just give me some good teaching. I went because I needed the divine touch of God in my life or for my situation to change it because there was nothing else possible to change this situation. Others in your life might not see God as you see him. Others in your life might not know Jesus as you know him. And Jairus then heard from God, from Jesus himself, don't be afraid. 
just believe. He didn't say understand. He didn't say analyze. He didn't say dissect. He didn't say question. He said, just have faith. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. And at that point, Jairus didn't say, no, 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 I don't believe you. These guys and the really good guys and they've been my mates for all these years and they're really well qualified and, the, you know, I really respect their opinion. They say, so I'll tell you what, let's just leave it now. In fact, you know, you stopped on the way. You weren't in a hurry anyway. So look, I'm a little bit offended now. Just leave it. He didn't say that. No, because he's still a dad that says, no, I still desperately want change. And I'm going to believe you above all other voices, all other opinions that are coming into my life about this situation. And maybe you need to do that today as well. Maybe you need to say, I'm going to believe that the miracle work in God that I know and I read of in the Bible and I see and I've tasted and I know that he's good is the same today and forever. Hey man, if you're saying amen right now, hit that in the chat. Put some fire emojis in there. If you're saying, yes, amen, I'm agreeing with this, then say it, speak it out, type it out, do something <laughs> to just respond to that's what's going on in your heart just now. Then verse 37 says, Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with them except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if there was other people in the crowd that said, yeah, 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 don't bother, don't, 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 it's over, man. Just leave it, leave it, walk away. Do you know what? In my life, many, many years ago, God spoke to me about a situation in my life, a very big situation. And um, I knew that God had spoken to me. But boy, on the outside, it did not look like anything was changing. And what I thought would only take a matter of days and then when it didn't, I thought, okay, it's going to take weeks. And then when it didn't take weeks, it took, I thought, okay, it'll take months. Actually, two years later, I was sitting with a friend of mine and he said, Liam, do you not think you just misheard God? Do you not think you just got this one wrong? And do you know what? I could have at that moment gone, do you know what? It has been two years now. And uh, maybe I did. Let's give up. Let me stop believing that word and I'll just go a different direction and make this thing happen myself. But I knew that God had spoken to me. And despite the fact that a very, very good friend and a Christian friend and a really great guy said, do you not think you got this one wrong? I had to say, no, oh, I don't think I got this one wrong. And you know what? Six months later, boy, did God come through in exactly the way that he said he would. And that's part of my testimony, my life story now. I can imagine maybe some other people were saying, yeah, yeah, leave him, you know, you might have, you know, there's no chance that. And Jesus said, look, you know what? All you people who are spreading unbelief here, I don't want you to be around me. And so he gets pretty selective. And this selectivity goes on in the next part as well, because it says this in verse 38. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Jesus got selective and maybe you need to get selective. Maybe you need to now look at you and say, well, who am I allowing in my inner circle? Who am I allowing to have a opinion that's loud in my ear? Who am I allowing to influence my life? Whose opinion am I allowing to influence my life? Am I opening my life up to people who are not of faith, who are not actually even following God, who don't want to follow the word of God, and they come along in life with some advice that simply says, do it because it looks good or whatever it might be? Jesus was not always Mr. Acceptability. He was not Mr. Inclusivity. No, Jesus, as we can see in the stories, was sometimes very selective, very radical, and said, that no longer is getting into my space. And it's not getting into this situation. This is a very good moment for you to say, wait a minute, I'm reviewing my relationships. I'm reviewing the voices I'm allowing into my life. And there's definitely moments in life where you do not need the wailing and the commotion. You do not need any voice that as well-meaning as it might be, that is not a voice of faith. You need 
faith-filled voices. You need faith-filled relationships. And you need to sometimes cut off who out the room of your life. Because you need a change. You need a miracle. If there is no miracle from God, it ain't changing. And at those moments, boy, do you get radical because you're saying, whatever it takes, I need this to change. And sometimes that does mean some radical changes, even on relationship levels. And that's what Jesus shows us here. He was not Mr. Tolerance. He was not Mr. I'll try and be nice and keep everybody happy. He was Mr. Radical that said, the most important thing is for God's power to be at work. And for that, there needs to be a a faith environment all around this little girl. And that's what's going to bring the change that is so desired. Where do you need to make changes to bring that to bear in your life? And in verse 41, it goes this, Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. I think they were overwhelmed, totally amazed, but not surprised. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone to Jesus in the first place. But the detail I want to bring out just as we come to a close is where it says this, and the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up. Why bother telling us her age? Does it really matter? What does it matter if she was 10, 9, 12, 15? In fact, why, why even mention an age. Why can't it just be, and the girl got well and stood up and was healed? Surely the point of the story is all just about a miracle, isn't it? Well, actually, the story that we referred to when the lady stopped him and, and got healed along the way, and when he took his little um, detour to deal with that situation on the way to this, she'd been sick 12 years. And so twice in the space of only a few verses, the Bible says 12 and 12. Highlights that for us, leaves that detail in. If we understand how numbers symbolize things in the Bible, then 12 always represents God's government, the kingdom of God. That's why there's 12 disciples. That's why there's 12 tribes of Israel. 12 speaks of God's government. And what this story is telling us here is this, another government got involved. Where I live in Germany right now, in a few weeks, there's going to be an election for a new government. People can choose a new government. Do you know what? In your life, you can choose a different government. And that government can bring all the change that it alone can bring. God's government. And as soon as you say, I'm allowing God in, I'm going to agree with God. I'm going to bring this area of my life under his government, everything is possible, any change is possible, because that government gets to work and says, right, the policy of heaven is healing. The policy of heaven is peace. The policy of heaven is answer and breakthrough. The policy of heaven is to take you forwards. The policy of heaven in every circumstance, in every situation is allowed to function. Change is possible because a new government comes in. Up until that point, in that moment, death, she was dead. Jesus said, no, 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 she's not, because you know what? My government's coming in. My government's coming in, it's going to reverse this situation. My government can do what no other person or power or organization or title or anything can do. If you let me in, everything is possible. Where in your life do you need to say yes? to Jesus. And sometimes it's just when we allow Jesus in, change happens that we could never have made ourselves happy. And maybe today you're engaging with us. Maybe today you're watching. And maybe as yet you do not know Jesus. And you're saying, Liam, I need my entire life to change. Well, I'm inviting you to get to know Jesus Christ himself. I'm inviting you to accept him now into your life as Lord and as Savior. I'm inviting you to open the door for Jesus to come in. And the way to do that, the Bible says, is repent. In other words, say, I'm going to not live my life my own way anymore. I'm going to turn around. 
and I'm going to say, Jesus, I want to live life under your lordship now. I thank you that you've forgiven me my sins. I thank you that you can now give me your righteousness so that I can stand before God. I thank you it's nothing to do with me, but it's all to do with you. Now I'm asking you to take the ownership and I'm asking you to take the, the, the leadership of my life and the lordship of my life. I'm now going to live as according to your ways and words. And I thank you, God, that I can be your child. And if you just pray that in your own words right now, God is going to respond to that. And then what we'd love to do right now is help you with that. And right now, as I'm speaking here on the Church Online platform, there's a little button appearing that says, I want to give my life to Jesus. Click that. Then after that, there's going to be another button that appears, do you want prayer? Click and say yes as well. That's going to connect you with some of our hosts and some of the leaders here who are going to then pray with you and help you make this decision and help you on that journey. Maybe you're watching later here on YouTube or another social media channel. There's many connection possibilities all around the channel here or on that platform. Connect with us and let us help you on this journey with Jesus. God bless you. I want to assure you, everything and anything can change when Jesus gets involved. Be blessed. Amen. Hey, Pastor Liam here. Thank you so much for having joined us for that word. I really hope that it blessed you and encouraged you. And you know what? If it did that for you, maybe it's going to do that for someone else as well. So why don't you share the link on social media, give it a like and get the word out. If you would like to sow financially into the ministry here in Europe, you can do so by scanning the QR code or hitting the link in the details below. Thank you so much. We would love to hear from you. So why don't you connect with us and contact us? And the details of how you can do that will be appearing on the screen shortly. We would really love to know who's listening and how it's helping you. Hey, God bless you. Stay in touch, stay healthy, stay well, stay blessed. Praying for you. Bye-bye.